Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. So I could talk forever. If you all follow me, I could be here for hours. So um, for those who haven't followed, I'm just going to show a short video because um, it helps kind of explain the better part of our journey. Um, and that way it'll catch you up. Otherwise, you'd be sitting here for hours. <laughs> and this is my first time ever speaking with technology involved. So thank you all for your patience and advice. <laughs> We found out that we were pregnant with Finn. We were very, very excited that we were going to be able to give Mason a sibling. Hey, you're, you're pregnant again. I'm like, what are you talking about? This was great. When we went into the ultrasound, we went in really confident. We were surprised when the tech, just without us really, really probing her, she said, I'm sorry to say this, but something's wrong with your baby's heart. Of course, for us, it was devastating. They discovered potential uh, heart defects. When you hear heart defects, you're, you know, your, your own heart sinks and you're concerned about what this means uh, for your child. We went to a couple other doctors. They said, I'm so sorry, this baby isn't going to make it. Time after time hearing, he's not going to make it, he's not going to make it, we were devastated. It was a very, very dark time not knowing what was going to happen. Finn was born at 9.01 in the morning. Finn has four congenital heart defects. Instead of a normal four-chamber setup, his, uh, he doesn't have clean separations inside his heart. Outside of his heart, he's got abnormal connections. He ended up having 10 surgeries, including the one open heart surgery. Being in the hospital for that long, it was a roller coaster, and there were certain parts where he was very critical and certain parts where they didn't know what the outcome would be. I would sleep in his room, and every beep I hear, you don't know what's going to happen. It's very difficult to go through emotionally, but at the same time, you're seeing a baby just fight every single day, no matter what challenge is faced in front of him. We are very blessed that this past year, there have been very limited times where he has been hospitalized. Anytime anyone would say no, he would kind of prove them wrong and say, no, I can, I can do this, but on my own time. Being able to witness that was the amazing part of it. I was just looking for some things to do to bring awareness to CHD. And a private school reached out to me and said, hey, our school does jump rope for heart. Do you want to come and tell your story? And I went and told Finn's story to the kids and they responded really well. That got back to the American Heart Association and one of their representatives reached out to me and said, would you be interested in going to any others? And I said, absolutely. A lot of people don't know that CHD or congenital heart defects, heart disease, is actually the number one birth defect of babies. Congenital heart defects in the U.S. as the rest of the planet have an incidence of about one in a hundred live births or 10 per thousand. There may be 800 to 1,000 kids born in Virginia with congenital heart defects every year. One of the important things that the American Heart Association does is provide research dollars for young investigators for uh, research in congenital uh, heart disease that have its footings in pediatrics. The American Heart Association has opportunities for all schools of all ages to be able to participate and give back. We go to high schools, middle schools, elementary schools, preschools. Put Finn in the car and go there and help spread CHD awareness and uh, let Finn show off his dance skills uh, in the school gymnasium. Our Heart Chase event for the American Heart Association, we set up 20 different stations or activities. Um, some of these are team building games, nutrition activities, fitness stations, and it's all based on learning more about heart health and how to be more physically active and what you can do to benefit your body. Kids come up to me all the time. When is Finn gonna be here? When is he gonna be here? I gotta make sure I'm here. What do I have to wear? They get excited to see him, so it's, that's a lot of fun for them. Whoa. Whoa! He has developed such a personality from it too. Finn will sometimes ask us on the weekends, he'll say, I wanna go dance with kids. He loves giving high fives 
and recently he's been really into giving hugs. He has a huge passion for it. The American Heart Association is a major funder for research for cardiovascular risk reduction. Uh, without the American Heart Association, a lot of critical research would not be uh, being done and the results that really educate the public on how to change behaviors and reduce risk wouldn't be taking place. Thank you, thank you so much to the American Heart Association. We are the ones who have been, but each of you, the donors, are actually the ones who are giving him life. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to give back, to be able to spread awareness. Awareness is key because the awareness leads to funding, the funding leads to research, and the research is what leads to hope for kids like Finn and families like ours. Thank you all for having me today. It's an honor to stand here and to share our journey with you. What you just saw was my youngest son Finn's journey from pregnancy to almost a year ago this past March. So allow me to elaborate a tad to put in a few missing pieces together. Both my husband and I grew up in Richmond. We met at a mutual friend's wedding in 2006. We were married in 2008 and moved to Fredericksburg, Virginia for my husband's job in 2010, where he accepted a position at the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., and has been there for almost eight years now. Like most people's lives, ours has been a roller coaster, so hang on tight because you're about to join me on mine. For the first five years of our marriage, my husband and I struggled with infertility. We tried everything to get pregnant and nothing was working, even when we were young, healthy, and all of our tests came back perfectly eight months of failed fertility drugs, and two failed IUIs, we finally became pregnant with twins. Everything was going great, and we made a big announcement on Christmas Day that we were finally expecting the first grandchildren on each side and the first great-grandchildren on, on each side. Unfortunately, I developed massive internal bleeding and lost both babies, which we later found out through tissue testing were girls. Our infertility before was diagnosed as unexplained, but now because of the rupture, all of my reproductive organs on my right side were gone, and we now had a 0.8% chance of getting pregnant. Even with the odds against us, we still wanted to try everything, so we took out a personal loan and proceeded with IVF. Weeks of shots in the stomach multiple times a day, daily ultrasounds, and another surgery, we found out that IVF had failed. We were in a really bad place emotionally, but proceeded with adoption to move forward with our dream of becoming parents. I had been praying for a baby and for God to allow me to be a parent every day for years. I was beginning to lose faith in everything, my marriage, my life's purpose, and myself. A few days before Christmas, I prayed a different prayer to God for the first time in five years. Please, God, I begged, please just allow me to be happy. Some way, somehow, please guide me to a peaceful place, whether that includes motherhood or not. I can't give up on myself, and I won't, but I need you, God. Two months later on Valentine's Day, I found out that I was pregnant. At our first ultrasound when I was only 11 weeks, the doctor joked saying, it's a boy even though it was way too early to tell. I asked how she knew, and she said, it has to be baby Jesus, because there's no way you could have gotten pregnant. <laughs> it's impossible. <laughs> she was right. It was indeed a boy. But we chose the name Mason James. He was beautiful, healthy, and arrived on October 17, 2013. Mason was only five months old when we found out we were pregnant again. Miracle number two was another little boy that we named Finley Noah. Finley meaning warrior and Noah meaning long lived. We prayed he would live up to both names despite the odds against him. So now let's fast forward to this past March, 
Since the initial video sort of caught you up on baby Finn's journey from pregnancy to birth to about a year ago, Finn had finally come home from the hospital after around eight months. He was doing well, but began to decline. My mommy gut screamed it was his heart, and I was right. Because of his complexity, we wanted to make sure he had the best care in the entire country. After much research, we chose the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Philadelphia, or CHOP, confirmed that Finn needed an open heart surgery and soon. A huge repair, his biggest yet. They couldn't give us any odds because of the multitudes of curveballs he had thrown in the past. Two days before his open heart surgery, the team sat down with us and explained that he would most likely come up on more tubes and support than the typical heart patient, and pretty heavy life support that included a ventilator and a heart-lung machine called ECMO. It is nearly impossible to put into words what it's like living each day knowing that it could be leading up to the day that you may lose your child. It's terrifying, sickening, and I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. But you see, that's the beauty of time. When we don't know how much we have left is when we truly begin to appreciate it. Inside, I was dying. But on the outside, I was a crazy person trying to pack in every single amazing life experience for a two and three year old in just a few months before surgery. We went to the beach. We flew on a plane to the Nebraska Zoo. We made huge messes and had a blast doing it. We ate ice cream and Oreos for breakfast. We had a gathering in our community. I would even call my mom to say, I need you to help me with the boys today because I'm taking them to ride elephants. And I did. I took a zillion pictures. I laughed, I smiled, I paused to breathe with every moment. I laid next to Finn every night by his crib and held his hand. I didn't sleep much. I was very scared. No, I was petrified. I was worried I would forget his smell or the softness of his skin. I was terrified I would forget how silky his hair was and the way it felt when I ran my fingers through it. When I would finally fall asleep, I would have visions of planning his funeral. But throughout this pain, we were living each day, and I mean really, really living. We were living beautifully and happily, taking in every single moment, breath, and heartbeat that we were given. <clears throat> On September 14, 2017, just a few months ago, we handed Finn off to the surgeons at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. This was Finn's 14th procedure. You would theoretically think that 14 times in two and a half years, I would be a pro, but there's no such thing. It was the hardest handoff yet. After we handed him over, I breathed a sigh of relief that he seemed okay, until they turned the corner and I heard him cry for me. The sweetest, tiniest, and most innocent voice saying, Mommy, I need Mommy. Every single ounce of my heart and soul screamed at me to run down the hall to give him one kiss just one more time. But who am I kidding? One more time would have never been enough. I cried really ugly all the way up the elevator to the main surgeon's office. Dr. Spray came in the office to sit down with us. We made a deal and we shook on it. He would give Finn life, he said, if we promised to make that life beautiful. We hugged, thanked him profusely, and then he changed into his scrubs and headed into the OR where Finn's chest was open, he was on bypass, and he was ready. The surgery was expected to last between five and seven hours, and the actual repair done by Dr. Spray was predicted to be about two to three of those hours. The surgery was under five hours, and Dr. Spray's repairs took just 37 minutes. Finn came up on no life support, no complications, and within two hours after surgery was standing up in his crib. <laughs> Not allowed. <laughs> in that instant, every ounce of pain, every sleepless night, every worry was completely gone. And that's not all. Our little miracle came home in just one week from the biggest open heart surgery of his entire life. Ben had his first open heart surgery when he was just three months old. Every day since then, I looked at his scar with so much sadness and grief. 
It reminded me of every single moment of struggle that he had gone through, and it broke my heart to pieces, knowing that his heart was so physically broken. But this new scar was different. After this second surgery, I see hope. I see happiness. I see birthdays, graduation, prom, college. The only broken heart I see is all the ones he's going to break when he gets into that <laughs> dating world as he gets older. But this new scar, this new scar is life. It's life, it's hope, it's faith, it's prayer, it's pure joy. It's everything we've ever dreamed of, hoped of, and much, much more. And quite honestly, it's a miracle. And don't worry, we're holding up our end of the deal. You know, the one we made with the surgeon right before he went into the OR? Finn's life is beautiful. We still take in every moment and cherish every minute, but instead of doing it out of fear, we now do it because we know we can, because we truly and deeply know the gift that we have been given, and we will live each day never forgetting that. But all of this is really not what I came here to share with you today. I want to share with you what this journey has taught us. Not just Finn's journey, but the entire roller coaster of life that you just journeyed on with me. The first and probably the most important is faith. If you don't have faith, what do you have? I once had a stranger message me and say, I'm an atheist, but I'm praying hard for your little boy. I don't know who or what I'm praying to, but I am. And that has always stayed with me. A lot of people think that faith is about religion, and that's not true. It's about believing and putting your trust in a higher power. Think about this. Have you ever seen a million dollars? Just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. Just because we may not see a good outcome of something in that moment does not mean that it can't happen. You have to hold on and you must have faith. The next is people. Surround yourself with positive people and positive things will happen. This entire journey has most definitely shown me that I function better with supportive and positive people around me. I directly react strongly off of my surroundings, including the environment and people that are in it. I could never take away the hospital room, but I could make choices as to who was in it. And I need those positive people to help me survive and to get through these challenging times. The third is giving back. Giving back is so therapeutic, and it's a continuous circle. So many people have given to us. They've given their time, their prayers, their talents, and without this, I'm not sure how our family would have pushed through. But it's so important that we do the same. Everyone goes through hard times, and it's not a competition. What's tough for some may not be for others. And when we can give, we need to. Our family is always looking for service projects, organizations, or families to help, even if it's just something small like a meal or volunteer work. The biggest beauty in giving back is that you don't have to have money to help someone. It's so important that when we are up, we do things for others that are down, because it is that continuous cycle. It's so important to be there for one another to lift each other up when we are down, and to celebrate each other's accomplishments when we are up. Quality relationships are what make a beautiful life, not quantity. The next is the little things. It truly is the little things. Little things make such a huge difference in life. Manners, holding a door, saying please and thank you, telling someone that they're doing a good job when you see they are really struggling, hugs, compliments, paying for the person's cup of coffee behind you and beginning a domino effect. Kindness is contagious and it doesn't take much to brighten someone's day. Something so small can begin a chain of beautiful events. Just try it and see. Next in line is perspective. Just looking at things a little bit differently. Beginning your day noticing the flowers in the vase and not the dust on the table. Ending your day with the peak and the pit. You recognize the pit or the lower part of your day, but you <coughs> always, always end in a peak. Hardest day of your life? 
I can still find a peak for you. Put your hand over your heart. Feel that? It's called purpose. You're alive for a reason. Keep going. You've got this. The next is stress. Easier said than done, I know. But worrying doesn't solve tomorrow of its problems. It strips today of its strengths. Allow yourself to troubleshoot all the what ifs, but then really focus on what's in front of you in that moment and take it in. One day, one hour, even one second at a time. Everything is all right in the end. If it's not all right, then it's not yet the end. I promise. Last but certainly not least, don't give up, ever. Wasn't it the incredible Dolly Parton that once said, if you want the rainbow, you gotta put up with a little rain? I wouldn't wish our journey on anyone, but I'm grateful for my struggles, because without them, I wouldn't have seen my strengths. I'm a better person, a better mother, and a better human being because of what I've been through. I'm not perfect by any means, but who is? And what fun would it be if we all were, right? Fight for what you believe in. Advocate. Don't ever stop believing in yourself. You are so much stronger than you think. Live each day as your last, because one day you'll be right. Thank you so much again for having me. And I'll open it up for questions. <laughs> Oh, the elephant? Yes. That was us actually going and riding the elephant. <clears throat> oh, with the lovies? Yes. So those were donated. We do so many different projects, and that was the first project that we actually did. We collected those um, lovies, and we delivered them to the hospital right before Finn went into open heart surgery. So some, mainly the biggest thing that we do is the actual lovies being donated, but we have had something where um, like $5 of it goes towards whatever cause, whether it's the children's hospital or it depends on the hospital need at the time, but is that what? You've done so many of those. Yes, we've brought in over 3,500 of those to um, two different hospitals. Yes, two different hospitals and then a couple of other individual um, organizations that really needed them and it makes a huge difference for the kids they really really enjoy them and um, Finn's had one since he's a baby that's how we heard about it Mason had one when he was a baby too so um, that was a really neat uh, project to do and was a great distraction for his first open heart surgery when he was three months old so. yes how did you do all this with a husband in DC and a two-year-old <laughs> <laughs> because I'm crazy that's the main <laughs> Honestly, I'm, I was just saying um, before, I joked with my husband um, before having kids that I could never be a stay-at-home mom because I'm just one of those people that likes to be doing something constantly. All of the jobs I've ever had in my life have never been sit-down desk jobs. They've been out in the field or you know doing something very high stress um, situations. I worked for a trucking company in transportation logistics for a really long time called Rider Transportation. I was the only female on the East Coast. I got cursed at every day. I had the most inappropriate things said, but I loved it because of the challenge. At the end of the day, those drivers were moms, they were dads, they were grandparents, they were dog lovers, and they hadn't seen people in weeks and they, you know, from being on the road and they were broke down, they just wanted to let it all out. So I liked that challenge, just that um, people person type challenge. This is kind of way going off topic, your question, but uh, I just have some drive that I just want to be doing something all the time. As soon as Finn came home from the hospital after the long stay, um, 
I had lost my job. I was walking in to the surgeon standing by his bedside after finding out if he was going to have a transplant or not, and my job called me and said, we can't hold it any longer, the trucker one. And I knew that was going to happen. My FMLA was way gone. This was like seven months later. Um, and I was like, oh gosh, when, when and if he finally comes home, I cannot stay at home. And if I never can bring him home, if he can't make it, I can't go home. You know, I just have to be mentally busy. So um, pretty much I'm just nuts and I just like to do stuff constantly. Um, but I've seen a huge benefit in Finn because a lot of opportunities are um, basically robbed from him for safety reasons. He cannot go to daycare. He's got a feeding tube still in his stomach. Um, he doesn't have 100% oxygen, so he still is a little blue and that scares daycare workers. Um, he can't get um, like public nursing help until he's in kindergarten because public schools do have that help. He doesn't qualify for that. So being able to do projects like going to the schools for Jump Rope for Heart and um, being able to deliver these lobbies, it's of course therapeutic for me and a huge connection of other families going through the same thing, broken leg or broken heart, it's the same emotion. We all don't wanna see our kids hurt or upset. Um, but those have been such an amazing um, distraction and have been so beneficial for Finn. He came home at a newborn level at eight, nine months old um, from being bedridden for so long. We were going around with schools with American Heart for three weeks and he was sitting up on his own. And it was amazing. He took his first steps at 18 months old and they weren't predicting he would even take those steps until he was two or realistically two and a half. He just wanted to be like them. They're his heroes and he <laughs> thrives so much in that environment. Now that he has energy, he's like a ping pong ball like all <laughs> over the place. Um, but also circling back to that, um, having a very supportive family and supportive husband, if that was gonna cause going around and volunteering was gonna cause um, disruption in our marriage for whatever reason, of course I choose my family first. But Michael has been able to go to an assembly and he the first time he went was which was actually when he got furloughed he's like nothing else to do i'm just gonna go to an assembly um he was like i get it there's something in him in finn that's like this is what i want to do um but it'll stink when he goes to school for the first time because he's gonna have to sit still and he's gonna be like what um but having that support and um just finding a balance um, and then I, I don't really sleep, but I enjoy that kind of thing. But um, my mind is kind of like an old Windows computer with a bunch of different things up. And every time I take down one, like 10 more pop up. But um, it's just some drive. That's the longest answer ever. I told you. I'd keep it. So, oh, yes. You know, I listen to you, and you are incredible. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. No, thank you. Thank you so much. There's, thank you so much. There's no way to do this without support, and that's been a huge thing. I have this kind of, um, like, kind of mantra for my own self that's like, just say yes. Um, and it's like, go to Richmond? Okay. You know, <laughs> go to do an event in Charlottesville? Okay. You know, without spreading yourself, you know, like too thin. But um, it's just been, you know, like, so you're a little tired that day or so you have to be in the car a little bit. Once you get there and the relationships that you have and the difference, you know, that you make, even though, it's, even if it's just something small, I've had people now that this page has been up for three years, over three years now, I've had people that followed just out of curiosity that now are pregnant with a child with CHD. And they said that they weren't scared because they followed Finn. And this is not the normal CHD journey at all. Most kids either don't make it and it's pretty much within the first year that's, you know, depending on the complexity, um, or they rock these surgeries and go home in sometimes four days. We kind of had the middle and that's not normal. Um, so I tell heart parents, I don't want our journey to scare them. I just want to show them that if it does go that route, there can be a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, 
but it's definitely been absolutely nuts. But the awareness is definitely um, key for that. Oh, sorry, yes. So, this is such a pre-existing condition which brings up health care. Yes. How, how much of a hindrance or help was that? So it depends because um, it changes so much. Like for instance, we've, so when we, Finn was a January baby, so we got really lucky because we didn't know what was gonna happen with him in the hospital. We basically were told what I just mentioned, he was either not gonna make it or somehow he was just gonna rock these surgeries. So um, when he was born, um, we were able to, within 24 hours, um, he was born on January 2nd, switch our insurance plan because once we found out more once he was born, we fell right at that spot where you could have, I guess it's called open enrollment. Um, when he was five months old, he went on state Medicaid from spending you know, enough time in the hospital. That was a huge help, but I also tell families too, Medicaid is not the answer. We've had some really crazy stuff happen um, that, Medicaid decided, oh, we don't want to cover that, you know, for either pre-existing condition or they claim he doesn't need a medication to survive, like a life-saving heart medication. Mm -hmm. And that's really tough and frustrating because why would a doctor prescribe something if it's not going to help them? Did you have a legal advocate to fight those battles for you while you were fighting? Yes. Her? So Finn was born January 2nd. By February 14th, he had hit over a million dollars in coverage. It happens very, very quickly. Obviously, we didn't pay a million dollars. Um, but at that point in Anthem, that gets you an advocate, which is like, yes. So no longer do we have to be on the phone. This was Michael's job um, for 800 hours trying to reach one person who keeps passing us off. Um, we got one number and one um, basically patient advocate to call um, who used to be a nurse, and that has been a godsend. This year is kind of funny, and I haven't had time to keep up on all the health care that's happening, but we've had now the same health care for almost three years for Finn, and all of a sudden this year it changed for some reason. Like we went to go pick up a medication that's supposed to be covered secondary by Medicaid, and they said, no, sorry, this is $130 a month because he doesn't need it to survive according to Anthem, so, or Medicaid or whatever. So, um, and the other thing is with Medicaid that I learned the hard way, it has to be in state. So he was med flown emergency um, when he was younger and we got a bill for $14,000 for the helicopter ride. And I was like, ah, oh, I'll just give it to Medicaid. It was an out of state helicopter. It just happened to be fueling from Greenville, uh, North Carolina. And because it was an out of state helicopter, they billed us because it was out of state, so no insurance you know, would cover it. What are you supposed to do? Be like, no wait, before you take my child to save their life, I need to know if you're in state or not. If not, I need you to call another one. So luckily they get these calls all the time and we fought them for about five months and got it down um, to a lot less than $14,000. But now we have a membership, which is so bad, um, a flying membership that you pay just $50 a year. And I tell all, even if you don't have a special needs kit, $50 a year and you can have your whole family flown anywhere, um, you know, as long as the doctor or hospital accepts it, that's amazing. So, you know, with or without insurance, but I think the healthcare thing is always gonna be a roller coaster. And that's why Michael and I make a good team because he enjoys that kind of stuff. I'm not sure he like lives for it, but he enjoys it. And he's very analytical. So um, his insurance with the government had over 200 different plans. So he had to go through and um, look at all of that, but having that um, uh, patient advocate, Jerry, has really helped us out a lot. So her name is Jerry, and she lives in Richmond, and she's awesome. So, um, oh yes. Um, what is long-term I have a two-pronged question. Yes. What is his long-term prognosis and when did we get to see him? Oh, sorry, he was right there. Yeah, I'll bring him in. He cries when he sees me for some reason, so I figured that, that we would wait like a little bit. Um, so. The long-term prognosis is very interesting. So we are 100% dependent on technology right now, which is why we're so passionate with the research funding for sides like American Heart Association and for Philadelphia. Right now, the damage is already done on his heart. His main pulmonary valve will not last until hopefully adulthood. Um, so he will need a valve replacement when he's an adult. That could mean age 15, it could mean age 40, 50. But the chances right now, he's only three, the chances of them needing to actually do a valve replacement in 20, 30, 40 years are 
I'm hoping to say zero, because just advances in his three years of life have been amazing. Um, so I'm hoping that when that time does come, there's some type of medicine that he could have, or maybe a non-invasive laparoscopic procedure, or even matrix style, where you just take a, a pill and you pick which one and you're good, or a scan, I don't know. But um, So we're 100% dependent on technology, so that's why we're very passionate um, on getting the research dollars to help with that. So. Sorry, my answers are so long. <laughs> are there any more? Oh, sorry. I don't want to be greedy with another one, <laughs> but what about Mason? How's he Oh, going? good question. So a lot of people say, like, oh, why don't you bring Mason to the schools? They're totally opposite personalities. So Mason thrives off of um, like schedule and his routine, and that's how it's been his whole life. Um, every time we've been to the hospital, especially the long, um, you know, months, he still went to daycare every single day. That was his constant and his friends. And then we had a different family member up each week staying at the house to give him um, consistency. Um, but he, if he goes to the school, he it's like so overwhelming for him and he just wants to be held the whole time but he's been doing really really well it was a lot harder when he got older and we are so blessed that we were only gone for three weeks with this past surgery between the week before surgery the week after and the week of because um i mean you'd have to ask um penny she had him for um a while while we were in surgery but I think he did relatively well, but then he was asking where we were a couple of times. He was asking, so it's very hard to explain to, you know, a three and a half year old, you know, what's happening. Um, so Mason, since he's been used to Finn's scar and his G-tube, his feeding tube, um, and the fact that we have to spot check him with oxygen, you know, he, from the very beginning, he has um, said things like, Oh, you have to plug in the baby? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you have to charge him? Don't you need to charge him? Um, so he thinks that that's charging the baby. Or when you put the G-tube in and give medicine or food, he thinks that's like fueling a car because he's a boy, and it kind of is. Um, we tell him what it really is, but he understands more in putting it in comparisons, like the car or a cell phone, like charging him. Um, and he also thinks that Finn's scar is just like another kid having blue eyes or glasses or curly hair. He doesn't, I've asked him so many times, you know, like, oh, what do you think about, you know, this? And he's like, mm. you know, like that's just, um, he calls him his baby Finn. That's just him. So he knows, he, he doesn't know any different. It's just like, you know, he knows that other kids don't have it and we don't have it, but it's just like if you had a birthmark or, um, anything like that, but he's done remarkably well. As long as he has that consistency um, and having family so close and retired has been <laughs> such a huge um, blessing. For, and I think it's been good for, I, Penny would have to do but I think it's been good for them because I always um, tell her families and when I meet their parents, like the grandparents, I feel like it's worse for grandparents to go through than parents because parents, you're just in this mode and you're worried about your child grandparents you're worried about your own child and then you're worried about your grandchild so I feel like having Mason and having that you know consistency of being able to know that because there's nothing you can do to help there's really nothing other than prayer and you know um, and Mason was that was definitely helping um, and he liked having you know his time and I feel like it was good you know for everybody but um, he's done very remarkably um, well, he did get a scratch on his belly the other day from his own fingernail, and he said, look, I have a scar like baby Finn. Because <laughs> we have to do scar massages on Finn, so now Mason wants his scar massage. <laughs> I was like, yours is going to go away, buddy. <laughs> um, but that's been kind of, you know, cool for him, but, oh, sorry. I just wanted to tell you how much I enjoy the Facebook videos when they're playing and the games. Oh. And my favorite lately has is the one where they stop and have to stop dancing. Oh I'm yeah. So, so I love to watch them interact. It's We've like, been so lucky to be. I have some people message me sometime like, "Thank you, you inspired me to have another baby so close together." And I'm like, "No, that's not my thing." So Mason.
Jason never had to deal with, you know, a newborn coming home when he was just a year old, having to feed him all the time and get up in the middle of the night and say, sorry, Mason, we have to, you know, take care of this baby. He was given an eight, nine month old that could smile, reach up, but not take his toys. It was the perfect situation for him. So they had a beautiful relationship from the very start. Um, and they've been so close ever since. Um, and Mason has been so patient. Like I said, he's the opposite personality. He is Michael's twin lookalike and personality, and Finn is mine for sure. Um, and he's just so calm and sits, and he was great with Mason, I mean with Finn, when he could only lay down. He would bring his cars over and puzzles, and it was so sweet, and try and teach him things and say, this is a kitty, this is a bunny. Um, and he would just coo, and Finn, Mason's like, he got it, he said bunny. And I'm like, oh, great. Um, and now that Finn's mobile, which is overnight, um, now Mason's like, woo, we can go and cause so much trouble it's not even funny. Um, they're, they've ripped down the front door, they've ripped down the pantry door, they've taken the baby gates down. Um, they have opened so many things that I forgot we even had in the house. Um, kinetic sand, which doesn't vacuum up. Um, they've gotten into so much you know, trouble, and it's like trying to find a balance of now parenting, but you know, but life is short. Like, this is fun for now, but you better clean that up. Um, and they used to blame it on the dog all the time, and now we don't have her anymore, but they used to constantly blame it. Um, on her, and she's just sitting there like, you know I didn't do this. So, um, but they've been such a great um, team for each other, and I, I hope that it lasts their whole lives, but I do know that eventually, I'm sure, they're gonna start going at each other for something, even if it's a high school girl, I know it's coming, so. Yeah. Any other ones? Yeah, Michael. Okay. Oh, yes. With you and your faith, how, um, I know you said having your faith is your grounding, but did you have certain things that you did daily, um, whether you read it or um, where did you go to? Well, some, that's a really good question because when I was in the hospital, my car, and I parked on the very top, the roof, it was in Charlottesville, so it was in the mountains, and I just figured at that point if part of my prayer or communication with God needed to be screaming that I would be up there and it was at a safe place because everyone's different and with myself if I I'm really good about shutting it off knowing that I can give myself a break later on because it helped me make rational decisions at a short amount of time but if I don't find that time to let it out whatever that means um, it's not healthy for me it's like a spiral you know effect so in the hospital, it was the car, I mean, you know, the car up on the roof. Um, this is really bad, but this is true. Now it's just when I get to shower. That's like my, you know, and one kind of um, like, not necessarily like routine or tradition, but I try, I like realized through this whole journey in the beginning that most of my prayer was for wanting something. I learned that like in the very beginning with fertility, I was like, oh man, I'm always wanting something, like somebody to not be sick, um, to, for our mortgage to get approved on this house, for me to please be a parent. Now, so what I try to do now is every single um, night in my prayers, I make sure, of course, um, there's always certain people going through, you know, certain things, whether it's a family member or a um, fellow heart family, um, but I always try and um, first and foremost, just thank him, you know, for everything and um, just definitely acknowledge that. I try to do that and um, be like, and if you're not busy, this person is sick, <laughs> this person needs help. Um, and another thing that I realized through the journey is that whole, um, like, kind of saying, of, oh, everything happens for a reason. I used to literally want to, when people would tell me that, but it's so true because there's versions of things so, and you may never know the reason. I may never know the reason, um, you know, of why all of this stuff has happened. But if God came to me and was like, hey, guess what? I can rewind and I can take back, you know, everything and you won't have to go through that. But I'll give you, you know, those girls, you know, from back. I would be like, no. 
it, everything kind of, you know, sorts its way out in a different version. And sometimes it's kind of even better, you know, than you could have hoped. Um, not to say that I would have, again, wanted to go through this, but I truly feel like we're given suffering and pain by God to appreciate certain things or to connect us with people, maybe not the way we would have liked. I say, um, I wish I, people that I've met in the hospital, I was like, I wish I never met you because that would mean that both of our kids were healthy and we weren't in the hospital. But I am so glad that I have because of the quality you know, versus quantity of people that I've been connected with. Um, and I feel like God gives us this pain and suffering for you know, a reason and just the world in general. And I'm like, well, if God could have come to me and said, I can give um, you know, this to Finn to another family, I would have been like, no, no, give him to me because somehow I was able to survive through it and another family might not be. So I would definitely say, give me you know, 80 Finns because I, somehow I'm able to do it. Um, and some people might not be able to. Some people might have given up in the very beginning and that's okay. Everybody's situation is different. I've had someone message me and say, I just found out my son had HLHS, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, which is one of the most severe CHDs that you can have. And she's like, I just need somebody to talk to that's not going to judge me, but we aborted the pregnancy. Every situation is different. There's no way they could have been able to afford, you know, that situation. There's no, there's no judgment, you know, at all. Everything, you know, kind of happens for a reason in some way in their journey, they'll figure out, you know, why that happens. Um, so everyone is just totally different. And it doesn't mean that you have to go some way or it's definitely not to stand up here and be like, if you have this diagnosis, just keep pushing no matter what your financial situation is. If you have 12 more kids at home, it's just kind of to, you know, breathe and reevaluate everything and keep that faith and hope that God guides you in the way that he's supposed to. That's going off topic again, sorry. <laughs> but I don't know if that's She's getting fed, so she'll be back in, and I'll talk for a couple minutes. Um, there's a pink handout, and Blair has them. Um, I think that I got this right. Blair put this together. It says at the top of the piece of paper, um, per her request, Blair's Presbyterian Women's Request, Kelly shared a list of some of the charitable organizations and businesses that the Blumenthal family supports. So this is a sheet with some of those on it um, with quite a bit of information, you're bringing them around. Blair's going to bring those around. So that might be something that um, is useful for you if during Heart Month you want to search out a unique gift or do something for them in their honor. Um, and I'll, when she comes back in, I probably will stop. I just want to thank our um, Mary Marthas today for coming in early. This was different and setting up um, and serving us our lunch. And they were Ann Davis, Susan Douglas, Sue Folks, Adele Topham, and Jill Trawick. And here comes Ms. Finn, Mr. Finn. <laughs> That when you came in before, we're not as interesting as all those children, probably. <laughs> I'm a hurt hero.